Last rush in Babylon. Babylon. Voices catching up. up. Voices catching up. up. Watch out, child. Watch out, child. 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 Babylon Babylon falling down. Falling down. 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 Society Society a broken promise. promise. Economies, Economies war, war, citizen war, whores, citizen whores. Political, pimps political pimps leaving us flat on our backs, on our backs. Trading, today, trading today waiting, waiting for, the for the promised land. First up, I'm glad to see you here, and I'm glad that I'm here. And if I say anything uh, that you don't agree with, let's just leave it at we don't agree about it, all right? There's no clear thought being exercised right now in the American public. They're allowing the insanity of the leaders, you know, to make decisions, all right, that really are not in the best interest of the public. They're not in the best interest of the children of the public. They're not in the best interest of the grandchildren of the public. They're not in the best interest of the earth. They're not in the best interest of anyone. I felt as though someone knocked me unconscious when I entered the world. It's been a lifetime trying to come too. I used to get this idea that I was in the wrong time and the wrong place. I thought that I came here a hundred years too late. The hundred years too late was because I used to see this camp on the plains, amongst the trees, by a river. It was a tribal camp, and I felt I was a part of it. It's like these thoughts were memories. Every part was familiar, and I was a part of the whole thing. There was another place, another dream. I can still physically see this camp. It was in the mountains somewhere. And my job was to keep peace with the wolves, keep peace for my people, to make this alliance. Crazy horse, we hear what you say. One earth, one mother. One does not sell the earth, the people walk upon. The spirit of life is almost non-existent in the perceptional reality of the society that we're in. It's almost non-existent. They got religion, they got civilization, you know, they got military, they got politics, they got all education, they got all the stuff. They don't have the spirit to live. I want you to listen to this man speak. His name is John Trudell. I'm a member of the American Indian Movement, and I'm from the indigenous nations of the Western Hemisphere. As the indigenous people, we have watched. We have watched this thing happen on our hemisphere. We have seen what has happened. We have seen them come in and confuse and attack. We understand that the issue is the land, the issue is the earth. We cannot change the political system. We cannot change the economic system. We cannot change the social system until the people control the land, and then we take it out of the hands of that sick minority that chooses to pervert the meaning and the intention of humanity. There was trouble in Custer, South Dakota yesterday after 200 Indians... President Johnson transmits the bill to Congress as Attorney General... The great lie is that it is civilization. It's not civilized. It's been the most, it's been, it has been literally the most bloodthirsty, brutalizing system ever imposed upon this planet. That is not civilization. That's the great lie, is that it represents civilization. That's the great lie. Or if it does, represent civilization, and that's truly what civilization is, then the great lie is that civilization is good for us. The conversations I had with him were, were e- e- explosive in their insights. and in, 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 They were exciting. I would imagine it was not too dissimilar from what some people feel when they talk to the Dalai Lama. John was way ahead of the game. He said, it's likely this is where the country's going to be on this issue, and this is what the effects are going to be, and he's been right. From the time I met John, uh, I thought that he had one of the most engaging minds of anybody I'd met. He's very charismatic, uh, very focused, 
Um, he, uh, with John, there was no middle ground. John speaks, and there's a, there's a simultaneous reaching out. There was a reaching across generations and a reaching across racial divides to say, we're both in the same situation now. We have lying dormant in us. We have a genetic memory. And in that genetic memory, there's knowledge. There's knowledge in that genetic memory, all right, that goes back to the ancient, to the beginning for us, all right? And in this genetic memory, there was a time when we were all tribes. Every human being lived within a tribe. Every human being recognized this reality that the earth was the mother and the sun and the sky was the father. Father, sky, mother, earth. Recognized that in our totality as human beings, all right, our relationship was to that. I was born in Omaha, Nebraska in 1946. My mom and dad and me lived out in the Brazil Creek district of the Santee Reservation, where my father was from. My grandpa on my mom's side was from Mexico, and he rode with Pancho Villa during the Mexican Revolution. He took my grandma from one of the tribes in Chihuahua, just kidnapped her and took her. After the revolution, they came up to Kansas because he was a wanted man. Kansas was where my mom was born and grew up, and my mom grew up as a Mexican. Growing up, we were poor, but I don't remember wanting for anything or feeling deprived of anything. It was a good world. And then when I was six years old, my mom died. I remember seeing my dad crying. He took me to see my mom in this hospital. I remember she gave me grapes, green grapes. She hugged me and kissed me, and then it was time to go. I didn't see her anymore. I didn't understand what had happened, but in some kind of a way, I knew I didn't have a mom anymore. And then God came into the equation, and I didn't like God. I never trusted him. To God, to God I, hope I hope you don't, you don't mind, mind, but I would like to talk to like you. To to you. There are some things, are we, some need things we need to straighten out. It's about, it's these, about Christians. these Christians. It's about these Christians. They claim, they claim to be from to be your, your nation, nation, but man, but you man should see the things, the things they do, they do all, all the time, time blaming it on you, you raping the earth, taking lying, more need, taking the more than they need in all the we forms of the why. greeds. They, they say, say it's, it's God's, God's will. will. I don't mean to be disrespectful, we do not mean to be disrespectful. but you know how it is. But you know how it My is. people have their own Our ways. People have their own ways. We never even heard of you until not long ago. Your representative spoke magnificent things of you, which we were willing to believe. But from the way they acted, we know you and we were being deceived. It is time for you to decide what life is worth. We already, we already remember, remember, but maybe, you, but maybe forgot. you forgot. When I was in high school, they drug me into the principal's office and they told me I had a lot of potential, but that I needed to learn how to study hard and make something of myself. And that's when I quit school, because I realized that we weren't operating on the same level of reality. Because, you see, I knew that I already was something. I walked out of that principal's office and the schoolhouse door that day. The next door I walked into was the Navy recruiting office. I was in the service, man. Oh, yeah? No. Decorated. Yeah, me too, Jimmy. You're not alone. And you should know. An upside-down flag's a distress signal. Kept a militant bull. Not a militant. I'm a warrior. The only reason I volunteered for the military was I needed to get away from where I was at. It wasn't about politics, patriotism, or anything else. It was about survival. I was stationed on a destroyer. I did two Westpac tours to Vietnam. And it turns out I made the right choice because the Vietnamese didn't have a navy. I was homeported out of Long Beach, and it was during this time that I met my first wife. Let's see, we got married in 68. We were living in San Bernardino at the time. And I was working, and he was going to school, San Bernardino Valley College. And Alcatraz happened in November. And I remember he said, um, we're going to Alcatraz. And I said, oh, I don't think so. I had cold feet. He said, put socks on. For more than six months, a band of American Indians has been living without government approval on Alcatraz Island, the rock that uh, used to be a federal penitentiary. And all attempts to get them off have so far failed. Welcome back. This is Radio Free Alcatraz from Indian Land, Alcatraz Island in California. The government has been practicing a policy 
of taking what they need from the Indian people, or not necessarily what they need, taking what they want from us, just about any time that they would like to do so, and they've been doing this through the years, they're doing it today. The garbage is piling up. The lighthouse is broken. But they say it's no worse than living on a typical Indian reservation. This is a country where all men are created equal, and it's the land of the free, and the home of truth and justice and liberty for all. Well, we want to know why that doesn't apply to us. So, uh, if this is the land of the free, then we want to know why we don't have the respect and dignity that all free men are accorded by other free men. The government had declared Alcatraz surplus property. Young Indian nationalists, claiming an old treaty right to unneeded federal property, descended on the island one year ago today and took it over. If there's ever going to be a, a generation of revolutionaries raised, people wanting change, these kids are getting these kids are getting good experience as to what uh, what our what Indian relationship is with the government, because this has been like all along the lines here. This has been a very peaceful protest. We occupied the island in the name of the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty. See, and and the reality that all tr that treaties are laws. So it was really about law. It was really about a legal issue, not a moral or an ethical issue with the government's responsibilities. What Alcatraz meant was it meant for the first time we saw young native people uh, standing up and saying, we have rights. We have, we have rights to the land. We have rights to our own government. And, uh, and we want to be listened to and we will be heard. Part of what we're saying on Alcatraz is that besides wanting the deed to the island for our cultural center, that we want to be treated as, as human beings. We want to be looked upon with respect as equals. Well, I can understand they might feel that way, but I don't think there's any doubt in anyone's mind that if the federal government felt as though they should come off, that they would come off in pretty fast. Approximately a month before we were removed, and, and the removal was June 11th, 1971, so sometime in May, the government called us together for a negotiation and said that they had a new proposal. They would lease us half of the island, and we could have jobs caretaking it and they would give us two hundred and fifty thousand dollars and we told them no because it, wa it wasn't about that we wanted them to legally recognize their responsibilities to the native community which we were representing we were negotiating with the government concerning settling the Alcatraz issue and they guaranteed us that no action would be taken against Alcatraz Indians as long as these negotiations were taking place and then they turned around and they came out there and they took our people off the island. They called our attorney at 4.30 yesterday afternoon and told him that they would have word concerning the deed to the island. They would have it for us Monday morning. And that's what we were waiting for. And they came in while they were doing one thing with their left hand, they came in with their right hand. They lied to us. John uh, Trudell and Richard Oakes, of, of all the leaders that came and went um, during the occupation of Alcatraz, were able to articulate uh, our feelings and give a name to what we felt and the name was independence and sovereignty and freedom and a right to our land. How does it feel to be here today? It just reminds me of other worlds. A lot of things have happened since I first came. First boat ride I ever made to this place, many things have happened. And and it's like so I was kind of maybe just remembering some of those things. I mean I've been to I've been to many Alcatrazes since 1969. Prototype people, rigid suit trolls near a brain dead. Under for spacious skies, gathering storm clouds. Rule of law, a falling axe in stormtroopers' hands. Cruel class deceivers claim God for their side, making up stories with places for meanings to hide. Dracula drinks deeply while nourishing his trap, the love of mankind, an alluring narcotic rat. Babel. Sex does love, sex is life, and sex matters. All through the course of the years of all of this, all I did was talk. And they cracked down hard just for that. I published 
published a book, uh, a book of poems. Uh, it's called Living in Reality, Songs Called Poems. And then I had an opportunity Sunrise. to record, uh, make a tape, a cassette tape, uh, where I put the poetry with the future. traditional tribal songs. Looking beyond industrial limits. Sunrise. Ancient prayers answering. Spirits hunted by technologic slavers. Good medicine seeing through the machine. I first was aware of John through, through political activism and then subsequently became aware that there was uh, an additional part to John as, as a poet, artist, spokesperson, spiritualist. And the, I, I think the connection, I, I had very strong identification with John's willingness to commit his life to a cause that was so dangerous and would require such sacrifice because I was so taken by the fact that the, the U.S. government would try to dismantle and decimate a culture by, by, by first stripping them of their spirit. We wonder what type of a condition exists when the people have been afraid to speak their minds. We wonder what kind of a condition exists when the people's spirit is says, at such a low place, at such a low place that they, they knowingly and they willingly go around and accept that they are governed by liars and exploiters. The American people laugh about how you can't trust a politician. Make, take, the people must take the political system under their control. During that period of time, the native consciousness was waking up. That native spirit was flame, starting to fire up. John made a transition from Alcatraz to uh, being involved very directly and very visibly in the American Indian movement. AIM was really about community, right? It was about the way of the tribe. You know, I mean, we, and, 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 you know, again, it was about a legal issue because from the political end, AIM's statement was same as Indians of all tribes Alcatraz. You have a legal responsibility. Treaties are laws. By the Constitution, they're laws. Well, when I look at America now, going back to the treaty, this American generation, they don't look at the treaty as having any validity. All right, well, I'm going to say that was an, an agreement made between their ancestors and my ancestors. And when they break that treaty like that, they're telling me they have no, no spiritual connection to their past, no respect for their past. And if we want to get down to the realities of checking legislation that's been passed in the U.S. Congress and, and doing our homework on agencies such as the Federal Bureau of Investigation and these energy mobilization boards, we'll find out that they now have all the rights and the individuals are losing the rights. And uh, it's almost sometimes I feel like a war is being waged against us. They lied to you, they confused you, they told you that you had freedom and democracy. But you go back and you read your constitution, you read your declaration of independence, and you will see that the only people who could decide these freedoms were white males who owned property, and all the rest of us were excluded. And what kind of a principle of freedom? I think they saw him as a tremendous threat, simply because he was able to mobilize people, motivate people, inspire people, and get them to follow him. For 500 years, we have had to fight and resist and struggle against the oppressor who has come. They called us Indians and said that we didn't have any rights. They called us Indians and said that we were no longer people. They called us Indians and they used their manifest destiny mentality to justify their genocide against us. In the 1960s, the FBI launched what it called the COINTELPRO program, the counterintelligence program. And essentially it was a program within the FBI to infiltrate the civil rights movement and to destroy it from within and from without. Um, in the late 60s, very early 70s, when uh, activists within the Indian community uh, started vocalizing the, their uh, situation with regard to deprivations of human and civil rights, uh, the FBI shifted or used the same basic tactics to go after AIM. Several groups of American Indians have banded together to march on the nation's capital for a redress of some long-standing grievances. But the president refused to see them. Congress is out of session. So today they took their caravan to the Bureau of Indian Re Affairs. ABC's Bill Matney reports. 
They came from as far away as the Pacific Northwest and as nearby as North Carolina, American Indians from 250 tribes. They came to the capital as a trail of broken treaties caravan, they said, to reclaim their lands and their rivers and most of all, their dignity. We occupied the national headquarters of the BIA. It was a big embarrassment to... <laughs> And we're talking about Nixon and Ehrlichman and Haldeman and John Mitchell, and if people remember history, well, just think of Ashcroft and Bush and Wolfowitz, and you're talking about these same mentalities. But we occupied that building and had it for a week. And the government was in a bind. See, and we pushed it pretty far. But we were pushing it again about the way the BIA was treating the people in the communities. We had a 20-point position paper that we were presenting to the, were, were presenting to the government about ways that they can, they can enact the treaty laws. from D.C. when the occupation ended at, at the Bureau of Indian Affairs, traveling back out towards West Country, and uh, I'd stayed on with the caravans that traveled through South Dakota, and uh, I remember when we got to Pine Ridge, the Dickie Wilson, the chairman, took a stance that he was going to uh, keep the American Indian movement off, off the reservation wherever he could. In February 1973, AIM and the traditional people of Pine Ridge occupied the village of Wounded Knee, taking a stand for the legal rights of the Lakota people under the Fort Laramie Treaty Law of 1868. The standoff continues at Wounded Knee, South Dakota. 200 Indians still occupy that small community and federal marshals still surround them. There were no incidents and no shooting today, fortunately. But there has been a lot of talking in a teepee talking between the Indians and government lawyers to try to find a way to end the impasse peacefully. AIM picked Wounded Knee, but the government picked South Dakota, all right? Because it shut down the momentum of AIM. The FBI noted that one of the things that AIM was shifting its direction towards was protecting the earth. At the same time, some 27 multinational corporations were coming into this region, uranium and oil uh, and other mineral companies, and basically leasing and staking claims throughout the entire Black Hills region. During the same time period, uh, the FBI declared AIM to be one of the most dangerous organizations in the country, and they began discussing the need for paramilitary assaults on what they consider to be certain AIM strongholds. Pine Ridge, the capital of the reservation, is about 10 miles from Wounded Knee, but it's as tense as the small community which has been held by the militant Indians for six days now. See, one of the things that, that the American government realized, and it, they saw this at Alcatraz, and, and they saw that it, that it was really more pervasive because they saw it in AIM, and that is that the majority of the American citizens agreed with us, right? They, had, they felt some kind of sympathy or understanding. The majority agreed with us, right? That the government was in the wrong in its dealings and treatment of Native peoples. So, so, and to the government, the way the government operates, anytime any grassroots or any anytime any group of people start to get popular support, this becomes a threat to the government. AIM got labeled by this Eastland Subcommittee on Un-American Affairs as a terrorist organization. And between 73 and 75, the government with the FBI, they were waging, they were, they were liter literally waging a contra war against now all of the AIM people and the traditionalists, the ones who had supported Wounded Knee. They were trying to eliminate this thought. In June 1975, two FBI agents were killed on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation in South Dakota. The community that they launched their attack in was a community of Oglala. In the course of the firefight that took place that day, one of our people, Joseph Stunts, was killed, and two members of the Federal Bureau of Investigation were killed. And as a result of that, you know, three men stood trial for it, Dino Butler and Bob Rabadou and Peltier. Then that's when they kind of just put the finishing touches on the momentum that AIM had. We had that Oglala firefight, and afterwards we got arrested, you know. 
he was the only one that came forward. Him and Neelock and Tina came to our defense and helped organize in the communities. And when we got to town and checked into this hotel and I turned on the news, and all the news in, these, in the local stations was really talking about, you know, there were going to be terrorist attacks, that the AIM militants were coming, they were going to be disruptive, they needed to have a lot, of, they needed to have a lot more security. And so they had created this paranoid climate. See, and all the media was carrying it. It's almost like, you know, like the government was writing it. You know, so we were not liked in that town. So we had a, a press conference. And right, I mean, right away and challenged them on it. Here are women and kids, and they met with every church group. They met with every women's organization, every community organization. Met and just explained, look, we're just here. We don't want to be, you don't want us here. We don't want to be here. We just want the opportunity. And basically, through that kind of networking and then the, the reality that hold it. These, these aren't Indians, they're human beings. See, that reality was emerging in Cedar Rapids. And this jury got to see it, you know, because we had a positive influence in that community. And, and in the end, when push came to shove, on the jury deciding on guilt or innocence, this played a role. So for that whole period of time, from the National Indian Youth Council to AIM and all Indians of all tribes and fish, that whole period of time, that activist period of time, that movement period of time, I think that the lasting effect of it was that it made the spirit of the people stronger. the woman. She has a young face, an old face. She carries herself well in all ages. She survives all man has done. Early on it was really a struggle of, of the women having a voice, you know, within the American Indian movement. And, you know, John was there for them. You know, all of our sisters. Me and Tina were a good team. I mean, I met her around the end of 71. Uh, by 72, we had teamed up, and I worked a lot of Oklahoma with her. She was always very uh, sensitive and very uh, concerned about people. And um, during the time she was at Tulsa University, she met John Trudell. He was uh, uh, there doing his, he was a speaking tour or something. She was just taken by what John was doing and fell in love with him. She was really an intelligent person. She got it. She's one of those people that get it, <laughs> right? And, and, we, and I think in many ways we complemented each other very well, right? And, and, uh, and just by who, her being who she is, she gave me credibility in the worlds that I wouldn't normally have it in, right? Because I was one of them wild guys, right? Her major in college was psychology. You know, it's almost like she knew she was going to meet me. <laughs> and so she already had her self-defense. And, and Tina had... Uh, She told me that she would stay with me on the road for no more than two years. Then she wanted to go home because home is where, for her, this is where it needed to be done. Tina had a way with our old ones. She, she knew how special they were and she'd make it a point 
to go and visit them and to hear what they had to share. She was one of those people who took time to go and visit others. And with her humble way and gentleness, they were just always so happy to see her. to talk about Tina. It's really hard, to, you know, it's still a, still a wound that's not healed. John at that time was in, in uh, doing his thing on the national level. Uh, they had the shootout at Aguala. You know, it was still, it was still a hot time. It was, it was still a hot time and things were secretive and, and, and people looking over their shoulders. Uh, where John lived, where Tina lived, was always being cased, you know, there's people saying that there were suits driving by all the time and, you know, checking it out, and they were always being watched. What we were doing in Duck Valley on her reservation, ser it, was, it, was, it seriously was a major thing for the system at that time, because we were really, the tribe, tribe was taking jurisdiction without asking for permission. The tribe was acting like a tribal government sovereign, and there had been conflicts with the federal government because of this. You know, Tina was a target because the threat that Tina posed to them, all right, is that she was from there, she was born there, she grew up there, they knew her, they trusted her, she was well educated, and she understood their system. For anyone to think that what happened to her happened to her, as specifically something just related to me, it minimizes who she is. burned the American flag in protest of the way that the American government treats the indigenous Indian people in the United States of America. I burned the American flag as an act of protest against the injustice that is being extended against all of the people. We burned the American flag because it has been desecrated and it's the only proper way to dispose of the American flag after desecration is to burn it. We feel that racism and sexism and class separation, that these are desecrations. And we feel that the American flag does not represent integrity, honor, justice, or truth. And he was warned in, in jail that his family could be in danger, you know, the way he's carrying on. About two o'clock in the morning, my dad came over to the, he was pounding on the back door. And uh, we opened the door and he, he was just standing there, and, and what struck me was his eyes were just sort of gray, it seemed, and he had his pajamas on, and he just said, there's a fire. The house is burning, and they're all in it. There was a, there was a line of fire across the roof. You know, some people that saw it from a distance, you know, it says maybe that, you know, somebody had torched it that way. In the fire, uh, the family was trapped in the house, and... Uh, Tina and her children were killed in the fire, and so was her mother.
Uh, Tina was uh, pregnant at the time she died, and they were they had chosen the name Josiah Hawk for the baby, and they put the name of the baby's name right on the headstone. And then the other three, Ricarda Star, Sunshine, Karma, and Eli, Changing Sun. I died then. I had to die in order to get through it. And if I can get through it, then maybe I would learn how to live again. Putting my love into the ground like this. Putting my love in boxes putting them into the ground and covering them up reconnected me to the earth. I was listening to the voices of life chanting in unison, carry on the struggle. The generations surged together in resistance to meet the reality of power. Mother Earth embraces her children in natural beauty to last beyond oppressor's brutality. As the butterfly floats into life, we are the spirit of natural life, which is forever. The power of understanding, real connections to spirit, is meaning our resistance, our struggle, is not sacrifice lost. It is natural energy, properly used. Remember the people. Remember sky and earth. Remember the people have always struggled to live in harmony, in peace. Struggle against selfishness and weakness so the people may live as nations. The old ways are hard. The people have always had to work together. Remember, impatient one. Remember and live. Do not be afraid of truth. Respect. Discipline. Share your life so the people may live. Honor sky and earth. Honor yourself. Honor your relations. Remember, impatient one the gentleness of time. About six months after the fire, I was with Dino Butler in Vancouver. He's the one that took care of me after the fire. And I was really desperate. You know, I didn't know anything, not even what reality was. Anyway, we were there in Canada, driving around, and I was feeling really bad. It was very overcast outside, and these lines came into my head. And something told me to write them down and to not stop writing them. And I started to write my lines. They're called poems, but in reality, they are lines that were given to me to hang on to. These were my hanging on lines. And I know that's real to me, that this is something that Tina gave to me as a parting gift. And somewhere in that haze and smoke, I recognized to follow where this writing would take me, to follow it, to just go with it. Whatever the madness, whatever the extreme I had to bounce around in, to follow the writing, and maybe someday I'd find some kind of center. This woman, this love, this life we dare to live, this society afraid of what people might see, might see through themselves or somebody else, might see what isn't meant to be hidden. Last time I saw her, Tina smiled, Woman, woman's love Hands so gentle, eyes so wise Woman touch, I am taken World so undivided Where the high wind flies And somewhere a wild horse listens I've often thought he was He was a living example of Uh of the line out of one of my songs that, that uh, Bobby McGee wears, that freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. He had, uh, well, he had very little left to lose after they had taken his family away. From it. And uh, <clears throat> I think it made him uh, fearless. So when I come to Canada asking for political asylum, I come to Canada understanding that my request for political asylum and the people that are traveling with me, that our request for political asylum is not just an illusionary fancy that's in our idea. It's not just an attempt to embarrass the American government. Our 
request for political asylum is built upon the reality that America is still conducting its genocidal war against the Indian people. Our request for political asylum is based on the reality that you cannot embarrass the American government. You cannot embarrass something that is built and based on greed, violence, and corruption. It cannot be done. We have never really seen the war go away. I mean, if you're dying, if you're dying from the 7th Cavalry's bullets, or if you're dying from induced poverty and racism and class systems and sex systems, all right, and, and you're dying from alcoholism and poverty, all right, or someone has come in now in the name of maximizing their profit, and they're getting you to work in the mines, the uranium mines, and you're dying from lung cancer, and you're dying from the cancers and the diseases that come out of that. You're dying. It's the same as the bullet killing you, and I, that's, I see it all as a war. You know, like I've heard a lot of people talk about the theoretical nuclear war. What if it ever comes? Well, you know, let's alter our perspective on that a little bit and say, well, the nuclear war is here. That's what that dead Navajo uranium miner is. He's a victim of that war. That's what them stillbirths are that came out of Three Mile Island. That's what the miscarriages and the stillbirths are in Pine Ridge, where the radioactivity is reached into the water. The nuclear war that is being waged against the people on the Western Hemisphere does not just happen and occur after the uranium has been made into plutonium. It occurs and it begins the day that some, one of the corporate terrorists decides, well, we're going to take the uranium from these Indians over here. And then in order to get the land, to get the uranium from under our land, and in order to maximize their profit at the same time while they are doing this, they use their law enforcement agencies, such as the FBI. They use them as a private standing army for the corporate state, and the FBI comes into our communities and they attack us while they're calling us criminals. And then after they have broken down and they have put our people into the prisons and they have killed our most vocal people, and they have driven our people underground, while they have used the taxpayers, while the corporate state uses the taxpayers' dollars to send its private army to attack us, then when the resistance is beaten down enough, then the corporate state comes in and makes deals with the federal government, and they walk away with all the resources at a very cheap price because their entire war against us was waged and subsidized by the American people under the name of law and order. So they get it for nothing and then they turn it around and sell it back to the American people. That is the principle behind maximizing the profit. It is the principle behind colonization. I met John for the first time when we were doing a couple of gigs around a nuclear issue. Uh, Mount Taylor in Grants, New Mexico uh, was the first date, and we were dealing with uranium mining on Native American lands. Uh, John really focused it for a large audience, and by, by combining with the No Nukes movement, I think, he brought a connection in the audience and in the press and in the Indian people's consciousness that was so powerful that I don't think that we've ever really been the same. And to have that kind of artistic voice that mixes politics and fantastic poetry uh, is, makes him very, very unique and very important. And I think he stands alone as being the most effective Native American activist we have today. I have to ask you this, since it's Columbus Day, does that mean anything to you as a, a Native person? I mean, with no disrespect to anyone, I think asking Native people to celebrate Columbus Day is kind of like asking the American people to celebrate Osama bin Laden Day. And, okay. I, and I actually think that terrorism arrived on this hemisphere with Columbus because for us as Native people, the experience that we had was, you know, I mean, how did my land become somebody else's country? <laughs> Fair enough. Columbus. I guess I'll just start with Columbus. See, I have a real problem about all of this. I mean, see, to me, he was like a virus, a disease. You know, it's like there's this predator energy on this planet. And this predator energy feeds upon the essence of the spirit, feeds upon the essence of the human being, the spirit. The mining of the essence, the mining of the spirit, mining our minds, the pollution from that is all of the neurotic, distorted, insecure behavior patterns that we develop. Because in order for this predatory system, this disease, to work, we must not be able to use our minds in a clear, coherent manner. As one of our philosophers, you know, as one of our... Socrates, he's like Socrates, you know, he thinks and he writes. And, and he's really analyzed the, uh, 
political system and its uh, ambitions and and what what turns the world. You know, he really understands that. And we used to have, you know, people like John, you know, centuries ago. But you know, they're few and far between anymore. The rains of purification, gently flooding. Memories fill my reason. Laughing shadows from yesterday, weeping to wash the spirit. Continue to struggle, resist. Be one with the purification reigns. The words, creation's breath of love. Reminders of power. Committed service for the earth. A people oppressed by the insecurity of the technologic exploiter. The people, the rain, the earth, the wind struggle together for a common liberty. I've been doing a lot of reading lately about um, your transition from political activist to poet to performer, and I'm struck by how many really talented people have rallied around your musical efforts. Bob Dylan called your first cassette with Jesse Ed Davis the album of the year in Rolling Stone. Um, it must be very affirming of your decision to put poetry to music. To have, to have recognition from these people or them to... Re to um, look at my work and know that it makes sense to them and I'm communicating something to people that I've listened to through my life. I mean, they, these are people that influenced me and to have them acknowledge me and however they've acknowledged me, you know, it, it helped, uh, it's what fed, helped to feed me, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, to keep it going. We took a cruise and, uh, and he told me he did uh, uh, poetry reading in uh, Northrop Auditorium in Minneapolis. And uh, he had a tape of it, so we he he uh, put the tape on when we was driving down the road, and, and he asked me if I'd uh, sing a song during one of his poems, you know. So we cruising along, and I just start singing a song uh, during it. And so he said, uh, he said, hey, would you come and do it in front of some people? You know, let's try it out. November '82, and he sent me a plane ticket to fly to Minneapolis. So I jumped on the airplane, grabbed my drum, and went over there and got there. And geez, it was opening up a Bonnie Raitt concert. It was North of Auditorium, and it was packed in there. And oh, man. I remember Bonnie brought us back. She sat us down, and she said, uh, I gave you guys a half hour or so, but this is a rock and roll crowd. I think, you know, I think maybe you guys should just do, you know, 15 minutes or something. She said, because this is a rock and roll crowd, they can get pretty loud. And John said, Bonnie, I can get pretty loud myself. <laughs> so we did it. And she liked it. She liked it, and, and uh, I guess she recorded a little bit of it and played some for Jackson. So we went in and um, a few months later and, and recorded Tribal Voice. When I made Tribal Voice, the whole idea was to take spoken word and put it with more natural and indigenous sounds like the drum and the harmonies and the chants and to take these elements and mix them together and see what we could create that could be reproduced on tape uh, using the spoken word with the oldest musical form. Brown earth color woman takes me into the secrets of her size. When I step into the brown of her eyes, I find sight of special dreams, fluttering eyelashes and fluttering hearts, dancing in magic no one understands. He's a dangerous poet, a visionary, a champion of indigenous people's struggle, a man who's come to give the fear of God and celebration of indigenous vibrations. Are you ready for a blues locked up poetic fist? Are you ready for the one and the American original, Mr. John Trudeau? We didn't need any book. Then the great spirit met the great law. Indians are Jesus, hanging from the cross, hanging from the cross, in the name of their Savior, forcing on us the trinity of the change, guilt, sin, and blame. The trinity of the change, guilt, sin, and blame. Earth is a living entity. 
earth will not, it is not in man's destiny to destroy the earth. That's arrogance. What it, what it is man's destiny to do is destroy civilized man's ability to live with the earth. So we, we as human beings, if we, use, if we take responsibility for our lives and live our lives in a coherent manner, as coherent as we possibly can anyway, then we will have an influence into curing this disease. But this disease, earth will not allow, the antibiotic will come <laughs> in a planetary sense. If it means open up the ozones and let it, let, it, let it wipe the civilized man out, then the earth will do that. The earth will continue on, though. See, maybe, maybe we should be developing our loyalty to this planet and this earth and our future, our descendants, more than we should be to governing political systems that have created all these problems. See, but now we have, most people are trying to find solutions to the problems, but they're trying to do it within the confines of the confined abstractions of democracy. And so if they're not willing to think objectively about our responsibilities towards our own descendants, then they will come up with no solutions. They will only perpetuate the enslavement and feeding them. Whatever my future is, I'm following the lines. I'm following the lines. Whatever it is I do, whatever unfolds in front of me, or where, you know, I'm gonna follow the lines. Whatever forms they take, you know, I'm following the lines. It's 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 the only, you know, and um, and see how long, and see how long I get to participate. <laughs> you know, it, it's you know, I, really that's what it is I don't you know uh, I mean there are things you know I'd, I'd like to do I mean I'd like to continue to write and do my music and do whatever it is that I'm doing but in the end it comes back she gave me the lines to follow and as long as I'm here I won't fall completely if I follow those lines because this thing about falling apart it doesn't go away time doesn't have that magic Distance is one thing, but magic is something else. And there are some falling apart, so there is no magic can fix it. Now you want us. Now you want us. Cry your tears for you after we've already bled for you, already been dead to you. Now you want to 